Greetings. Welcome back to our study or our course on time management for pastors. I hope that you are applying all the information that we're learning in this course. It is uh, such a great key to becoming a more effective leader, a more effective teacher, and, and uh, you know, parent, spouse, all the things. So, um, I'll just remind you where we're at in our, our course of study as we get to this uh, this lecture. We've uh, looked at the weekly planner, the importance of keeping a weekly planner, and uh, again, that might be suited very differently from mine to your needs. Uh, but uh, making sure that you are getting those things written down or recorded digitally or whatever it is. Uh, we looked at the weekly assessment and the incredible importance of making sure that you put something out there uh, every week for review, taking some time to assess and consider and think about your week. And then today we get to look at priorities, casting, uh, creating your yes list so that you can learn to say no. And it's uh, for many pastors, myself especially, it's one of the great challenges of pastoral life. You want to be someone who can say yes. You want to meet expectations. You want to support people's spiritual growth. There's just so many things that uh, will happen in a given week, and only so many things fit in a given week. And yet, we never want to be that you know that no pastor, the one who disappoints some kind of uh, unseen or spoken expectation. So that brings us to the conversation that we have to have about priorities. And I would like to draw your attention to the distinction between ideal priorities and idealized priorities and actual priorities, right? So first of all, we want to come up with our ideal priorities, those priorities which we know are at the top of our list, are the most important for us. And so uh, if we are as we are believers, as we're Christians, of course, we're going to go to the Word of God and find out uh, what those priorities should be and how they will differ from person to person. For instance, a married pastor with, uh, you know, wife and children will have part of their priorities, in fact, very high on their priority list, according to God's Word, uh, their family. However, a single pastor might not have as many of those uh, priority commitments, of course, extended family, and, and that's always going to be important, but it's a different level of responsibility, right? Obviously, our prime priority is bringing glory to God, regardless of uh, what we are doing or how we are uh, accomplishing that. The, the final goal is to, to bring glory to God, and that lends itself well to recognizing that your uh, growth in Christ is a priority, right? To grow in Christ and to honor Him uh, in our life demands that we take some time of devotion, of Bible study, of you know, uh, prayer, and, and all of these important things. And another major biblical priority that you would set as a pastor is, or a missionary, is your ministry or your church family, right? Making that a priority in every way. So um, we could extend, in fact, I encourage you as you think about this to expand your list out, but do write them down. I, I know that's sort of the, uh, the, the, the constant drone of this class, but I am a firm believer that when things get written down, they can be dealt with more clearly, right? They're no longer as abstract, and you can say, no, these are my priorities. I'm written here in this book or on this list, whatever it is. So um, the next difficulty or challenge comes to us in recognizing that many people could look at our lives, like an alien from above or something, looking at uh, down on our lives might say, well, that person's priorities are actually this, this, and that. That's where they spend all their time. And that gets us to that potential, if not actual, tension between our perceived priorities and our um, our actual priorities, the priorities that we kind of let happen to us, or, or rather, maybe a better way to put that is how we spend time or waste time uh, violating our true priorities and convictions. And so that is what this time of consideration is about, is to be able to uh, understand as well as you can what your priorities are from the Word of God, what your priorities are in life, and how does that differ from our actual priorities? And you say, well, how can we know what our actual priorities are? Self, uh, self uh, examination is a difficult task because we always, you know, kind of see out from here, right? Our, our perspective uh, is is very, very insufficient as we look at ourselves and examine ourselves in a lot of situations and we wind up being particularly blind to things so we need uh, different mirrors to look back of course the word of god is one such mirror that helps us to uh, look and compare you know what is going on in our heart versus what the lord has revealed but on other practical methods we have your finances your finances how you spend your money how you invest your money uh, will show a great deal about your uh, priorities if you're the great portion or an 
a very large portion of your finances going towards entertainment, a hobby, a support, a sport, or something like that, then you're going to have to recognize that that is a bigger priority than you might have set it on your list. And why did it become a priority? Is it pursuit of pleasure? Is it just necessary relaxation? How did that work out? So your finances are the first place that I would recommend you look. And this uh, in today's age is generally quite easy because it's not like dollar bills are you know running through our fingers often more likely we can go on our bank's website and say okay i spent money on this this that many uh, banks even have tools to help you categorize and understand that well so uh, taking advantage of those and finding out where your money is going even if you're not in financial difficulty or you're not too strapped for cash it can still be valuable to look at where your finance is going how's your giving are you giving to the lord are you using money to 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 make friends and to build up uh, you know your church family and so on and so forth the next place to find your actual priority is your schedule and praise the lord you've just spent some amount of time building and keeping a schedule and it's one of the great advantages i go back through my uh schedule my weekly planner and even though i've switched some things some certain things like my task list is oftentimes duplicated or my schedule is duplicated on um, online on an online calendar uh, for ease of access to others i still keep the paper calendar because it's easier for me to flip back and say oh yeah that week that week i remember what i did and that look at that how much time is spent on and that's why i highly recommend backfilling your calendar because that is to say if you had a space and you knew you had five tasks well which tasks did you do in that time how much time roughly did they take and and um so you have something to look at and go well that's where my time is going that's what's going on uh and then imagine i guess you could do it literally but that wouldn't be my necessary recommendation if you uh were to let someone else look at your calendar someone else look at your schedule someone else look at your finances what would they say your priority is on and next i'd say you find your actual priority in terms of your attention this one's harder to track or manage or observe but what is it that you're always thinking about what is it that you're always talking about what is it that you can't get enough of talking about right um and that attention can betray an unhealthy uh, interest in in again politics or entertainment or something else and it's not to say that those things are necessarily bad in and of themselves but they can become an obsession for us if they are the constant uh, thing that is at the center of our of our attention, right? Obviously, we want Christ to be at the center of our attention, our thoughts, uh, and and uh, again, our Bible reading and prayer, our family, our friends, the people, the relationships that are important, the work of the gospel, and on and on and on. Um, trying to track what you pay attention to is a little bit more difficult, but it can be easily uh, done, at least in a really primitive form, with your pad and paper. So, uh, a pad and paper, you know, like something like this that you just grab and you know write the date at the top and thought log something like that and just take time to go was i thinking about was i thinking about was i obsessing over politics again was i obsessing over this uh relationship with this person who gives me heartburn or whatever it is right find out what your attention is where your attention's going and you'll find out something about your priorities so highly uh, highly recommend that self analysis so that you can draw the distinction between what you what your ideal what you think what you understand God's priorities to be in your life and how that's actually playing out or not. That's a big part of time management is or really just any life is learning to be honest with yourself and say, no, no, I'm I've, I've over rotated on this or I've gone overboard on that. Um, that we are, uh, as we said before, particularly blind to our own life in our own way of living and these are tools that help us to be able to see what's going on within ourselves right what's going on with with our life and our time and not just kind of putting that back to the hazy ethereal well i think i, I pray a lot i pray a lot well i'll talk more on this of course later nevertheless we have to notice that ministry will never be done i don't uh, many jobs are like this but not all there are certainly jobs where you can wake up show up at work to some degree or another uh complete certain tasks and at the end of the day clock out and potentially not think about it if you didn't choose to until you got there tomorrow to do your tomorrow's tasks pastoral ministry ministry in general is not like that it's always there and there's always more work that you could be doing uh, and that can be the death of a pastor right that constant f 
flow of more people to meet. There's always more things you could do. There's always a better, you know, way, uh, better, bigger, better ministry or something you could be a part of or something you could invest in. Uh, and then uh, coming with that oftentimes is a sense of, of guilt or even shame over what we weren't able to do or what we weren't able to accomplish. And that's why it's so important to think very deliberately about all these things uh, because otherwise you just become the victim of an unsolvable puzzle. You get crushed by something that no human could bear. So there's always going to be something more to do in ministry. You have to remember that because if you're going to prioritize your family as you should and your devotional life as you should and some of these other things that we're talking about, then you are necessarily going to have to come to a place where you, uh, you know, do part of a task and return to it later, right? And that's that critical needs nice, right? You, you accomplish the critical things, you've done the things that were needful, and now it's more important to, again, uh, invest in your family, do something else, rather than burn yourself out with 24 hour a day, you know, on mentality. There will always be more to do. There's another person to meet, another class to teach, another ministry to start, and one pastor cannot do everything. Now, this whole class is designed to answer that question. One, in terms of organizing, deciding what you're going to do, and two, in terms of including those others around you in, in what you would like to do, what you know you're meant to be doing. But I do want to hit some cultural pastoral myths. There is a cultural idea of what a pastor should be, and there's a biblical idea of what a pastor should be. I'll encourage you to take on uh, our course on spiritual leadership or various other, um, you know, the commentary on Titus, other things that will help encourage you to understand on the biblical side what a pastor is supposed to do. But we have to recognize that those cultural pastoral myths can be truly destructive. We could really lose a lot of our time to these things that are not God's requirements or God's expectation over the pastoral life, but it, they come from our culture and the kind of evolution of of Western the Western Church and and the idea of the professional minister building into a well okay well what does that guy do well not the Bible's definitions but rather you know what did he do in in this or that time period of of church history and ours is another one of those but ultimately it's the word of God that matters. So you might hear this myth that the pastor is meant to be at every church event. Somehow the pastor is just the throbbing heartbeat of the church and is meant to be there at every, you know, men's ministry, women's ministry, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's not a feature of a healthy church family. In fact, uh, we could first of all note that the idea of a single pastor, while it's totally appropriate to have one pastor, one person on staff, he's meant to be functioning as part of an elder board, people who are sharing equally uh, the... Um, responsibility and potentially, you know, many of the responsibilities of running the church. So the idea that the pastor has to be at every single event is a miss because that makes a pastor-centered church ministry rather than a Christ-centered church ministry. So realizing that, one, it's okay for people in your church to do things, you know, without without you or with another elder or, you know, have someone else leading a small group or a Bible study, whatever it is, it's not ideal to be uh, so committed to the church in the sense of feeling like it can't happen without you or that something the Lord can't do anything apart from you. The pastor's family is required to be involved with everything. This is another one. Protecting your family after a fashion from the uh, difficulties of ministry is a real challenge. And there can be expectations that just because you're the pastor, your son or daughter has to be at every youth group ministry, or your wife has to be in charge of the, uh, what you know, Sunday school ministry, the women's ministry, what now those things might happen, right? But this recognition that uh, pastoral success is not measured in terms of the pastor, the expectations put on the pastor's family in that way. Now, Titus and Timothy do give some good biblical qualifications for the nature of what the pastoral household should look like. But one of those is not the pastor's wife and children are the first unpaid uh, you know, employees of the church. That is not how that is meant to work. And thus, as a pastor, you need to rec uh, defend your family against those feelings of unfair and unreasonable expectations. Next, the pastor is always available whenever someone wants attention. I have a crisis. I have a thing. I need to talk. I need to pray. I need to... Ba -ba 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 -ba. And we'll talk about this more when it comes to priorities, but there will always be an emergency that's not an emergency. A person who feels like they need right now attention for whatever reason and uh, for some reason feels like they are, um, are, are have a, a freedom to demand immediate attention from the pastor. And that is absolute hogwash. Now, there will be situations, in fact, uh, 
naturally very occurring very few wherein crises come up you know loss of a loved one or someone becomes ill or gets in a car there there, there will be legitimate emergencies as things go but it's really as as one who has lost countless hours to someone who came you know called in an absolute and utter panic every time their day started to go a little bit south or every time they had a minor conflict with their spouse or with their work uh, whatever it was right that they just felt like they could immediately run off and had license to uh, commandeer the pastor's time for their issue and uh, it's really important to recognize a pastor may be your friend but the pastoral role is not your friend um, in fact, it's one of the functions of the church that you would build lots of good relationships so that if you need help in those types of situations, that can be dealt with. And so as a pastor, you need to encourage that kind of behavior by discouraging being uh, kind of there for everyone all the time. This is a, a false view that, that the pastor just sits around and does nothing and waits for people to call. Um, if you're able to find that kind of a pastorate, then may the Lord bless you in it. <laughs> but every pastor I know works hard and fills uh, more hours than, you know, the normal 40 or 50 that we would call a work week uh, it, without even breaking a sweat. So adding on that being immediately and instantly available to everybody is a toxic attitude. It's it's mistaken. It's wrong. And so uh, we, we have to recognize that are we can't expect the sheep to put those boundaries up for us we have to put those boundaries up we have to be willing at times not to pick up the phone even though they rang three times we have to be willing to to say no i'm at my son's concert whatever it is if the church is burning down the church burns down that'd be very tragic but i do I, i'm here now i'm doing this thing now so um, next, the pastor is the one who does everything at the church. The pastor, I mean, he's paid, so why isn't he doing all the maintenance, all the visitation, all the bookkeeping, all the, all the, all the, right, answering all the phone calls, answering all the emails? Why doesn't he do everything? Well, one, that's a very unhealthy perspective on ministry, as we've already seen. It's not about the pastor doing everything. It's about the pastor and the elders equipping the saints for the work of ministry. It's not that really all that complicated uh, in terms of how it's meant to play out biblically, and yet we make it complicated for ourselves by suggesting that since we're the one who is, you know, on staff or is holding the ball in some sense, that we feel obligated to absolutely every single action or oversee every single, or rather personally do every single action. I have seen, and part of this might have been that that was in their passion field, but I have seen pastors lose half their week every week to you know, putting in new floors or putting in new, you know, constructing new things or fixing up the building or doing building maintenance. And you're going, if your body is so low, um, low demand that that's possible, then, and, and you, that's what you enjoy, then maybe that's a thing to do, but it's unlikely. Uh, I, again, I don't know a pastor who's in that position where the, just the, the body of the church is just so low maintenance that they just they spend all their time building the building or painting the walls or doing whatever it is, changing light bulbs. This is a false idea, and the sad thing is, is that most people really do, th or not most, many people really do think that what the pastor does every day is just sit around and wait for folks to call, or whatever that is, or it, um, and should be the one doing, again, all the gardening, all the mowing, all the weeding, all the... And uh, it is important that this, the saints of the church need to be built up to do the work of ministry. And part of that work of ministry is those who have gifts and abilities in building and maintenance that they would give those to uh, help the church, help serve the church and glorify Christ. So keep in mind, this isn't all of the pastoral myths that could get into our uh, under our skin and, and cause us to sacrifice and compromise true biblical priority, but they are some of them. So that brings us... Oh, and the pastor is everyone's punching bag, right? The pastor is there to be available to everyone's abuse all the time. That, that just needs to end, right? It's not an appropriate thing to think. So, figuring out your yes. Now, Stephen Covey, I believe this comes from um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which hopefully you're making your way through and preparing to write your final three-page paper on. But uh, it talks about your yeses and your noes, right? Uh, figuring out now most of us will go through and evaluate every single decision someone comes up can we do coffee today yes or no can you write a 
you know, an article for my journal, yes or no, right? We think of all these things, and, and they are, of course, as individual decisions. But if we take a step back and consider our priorities, it helps us figure out what our yes is. And this is the, the big paradigm shift that I hope we're, uh, we encounter, is that rather than thinking of just all the little tasks, figure out what the bigger picture, the vision, mission, uh, and gifting of your life is, and make sure that you're saying yes to that first, so that when you can say, when you need to say no to something, it's not just an arbitrary random, no, I don't feel like that today. It's no, I can't because I have my other priorities that I need to do, and I can't take away from these major yeses that are my mission, my calling, and part of you know my work as a pastor in order to do this no task. So it, it, it de-emotionalizes those decisions if you can um, a- apply it perfectly, which of course we'll all struggle. But if you, the more completely we apply this, the more confidently we're going to be attached to the, the, the reality that it's okay to say, no, that's not within the purview of my ministry and my uh, dedication. That's not one of my yeses. So even though it's a great thing to do, and even though I would love to do it if it was one of my yeses, it's not. So I can comfortably and easily say it's not out of a personal rejection. It's not out of a uh, belief that that task or that invitation is not worthy of you. It's just simply recognizing you only have that certain amount of time. And so uh, you've got to give it to what matters. So some yeses that I'll recommend for you, you ultimately get to decide what your yeses are, those big priorities. Uh, Teaching the Bible. If you're a pastor, teaching is part of your yes, absolutely. And making that your yes means that you have to prepare to teach, prayerfully reading, studying, uh, you know, preparing messages, perhaps PowerPoints or handouts or whatever it is that makes uh, helps you teach effectively. That needs to be given time and priority. That's not the thing to do at three in the morning because you couldn't get it done any other time, and it's certainly not a Saturday, to be a t- Saturday night task. I mean, if that's your flow, then great, but. Um, in more realistic terms, you have to recognize that it, you, if you don't make this teaching of the Bible a priority, one, you're going to find that you personally kind of uh, get starved out, but two, that you're not going to be providing the teaching of the Word of God that the body of Christ needs in order to grow to maturity and minister more effectively. So by, you know, saying yes to teaching the Bible and preparing to teach the Bible specifically, uh, you will find yourself making good Uh, you know, good progress in your ministry. Next, family. Family has to be, if you have a family, an immediate family, that has to be one of your yeses. That is a yes bar, uh, you know, par excellence, bar none. Uh, We need to, as ministers, and this is very important in Timothy and Titus, is that the family life of a minister is important to his continuing qualification. We'll talk about specifics, specifics of that in other courses. But what that tells us is that it is God's priority. So if you need to take time off or away from a church commitment to minister to your son or daughter or wife or care for your son or daughter or wife, that is also God's priority trying to keep you in keeping you qualified for the task, managing your household well. So um, that that has to be one of your yeses. If that ceases to be one of your yeses, then you got an issue. Uh, discipleship. Discipleship meetings and building up other leaders and teachers and and, uh, servants within the church is compounding effort, right? You're preparing someone for ministry so that they can then be active in your church, thus meaning that you are doing less less than everything at least, (laughs) but less because you've been able to give away that task to someone else. Discipleship should be one of your yeses. Whoever those, uh, you know, one, two, three people that you're pouring into and investing in should be something you do. Church administration is probably going to be a yes if the, uh, you know, if the... uh, Parts aren't working together, all working together, and it's very likely, especially if you're in a small church, that you're going to be doing a lot of that administration work as well. You might have uh, be blessed to have a secretary who can able to take care of more clerical administration tasks, uh, but ultimately you, you have to be involved in making sure that the elders board, deacons board, are uh, doing what they're meant to be do. There's doing, there's peace within those uh, and productivity within those bodies and organizations or groups. So that's probably going to be yes. Pastoral duties, right? As we said before, it's not that the pastor's full job is visitation, but I think it's a very appropriate thing for a pastor to do. Pastoral duties such as caring for and counseling people within the context of the time that you have available is important. So those sorts of pastoral interpersonal duties and those acts of service need to be understood and be said as a yes. In other words, that's that's an important thing. It's an important part about it. And understanding how we... Uh, 
you know, fit that into the schedule rather than letting it own our lives is a big issue. So once you've figured out your yeses, right, you've got that all written down on a piece of paper, then everything else is no. Okay? Everything else at that point becomes no. Now, I'm not suggesting that there won't be times when you don't, you know, slip into doing some things that are not a part of your yes. I mean, uh, that, that don't contribute to your, your yeses. But uh, more, more often than not, you need to have and give yourself permission to say no. Parachurch ministries, missionaries tend to be a huge uh, distraction for pastors, right? They've, uh, they've all got a wonderful ministry, a wonderful thing, and they're ready to do their pitch, and they want to take you out to coffee or take you out to dinner or whatever it is and uh, take up time that if it's available, then by all means. But if it's not, you don't need to be feel bad at all to say, I appreciate your ministry and I'm thankful for you, but I don't have time for that right now. I'm not, I'm not vetting missionaries today or whatever it is. So um, l- learn to say no. You're not a bad person. <laughs> You're not a bad pastor for uh, pointing out that you just don't have the capacity or the bandwidth to entertain every ministry salesperson who comes up. Uh, extra appointments, right? There are certain times when you need to make a connection with a person that is uh, productive for the ministry, supporting their growth in Christ, something that's very spiritually edifying and valuable. And then there's other times where an extra appointment might just be, you know, because someone was bored. In fact, it's kind of funny, as I've noticed over my years in ministry, that uh, you don't really get vacations. You work hard all, you know, all year long. And then finally a day off or a week off or a month off comes around and all your people who have the day off from their work are like, well, I want to hang out with the pastor. I want to call the pastor and hang out with him. Um, Again, choices that you make on a case-by-case basis. But you need to recognize that just because someone else is available doesn't necessarily mean that you're available, right? And if there's something to discuss and accomplish in that time, then great. Uh, take it up. But if it's just a social call, recognize that that is a lower priority. That might just be a no that day. Salespeople of all stripe and of all kind, whether they're selling Sunday school curriculum or selling copiers or selling, you know, light updates, whatever it is, those salespeople need to be absolutely uh, ignored, (laughs) removed from your life. Remember, a salesperson has an agenda and has no conscience or care of anyone but his goal or her goal, which is to sell the unit, sell more units. They can't survive if they behaved like human beings. So you cannot, you know, get emotionally invested and feeling bad about telling a salesperson, I don't need a copier, please don't call me back. I don't need, we don't need Sunday school curriculum right now. I'll take down your name and please don't contact me again. So on and so forth. Whether it's real estate or all sorts of different sales calls, you need to just learn that they're not your problem. There might be some special case where you have an opportunity to minister to a person in that situation, but more often than not, in my experience, they're just shooting for the sale and really are not available for anything else. So don't waste their time. Love them by telling them that you're not available and that you need them to go away so they can go find someone who might say yes. Next, uh, the lonely and the bored. The lonely and the bored are are a a constant challenge in ministry, whether it's because people just lack the interpersonal skills or they lack the ability to uh, build healthy relationships. They'll very frequently be attracted to the pastor and you can feel like you're really helping them out in fact they'll tell you how thankful they that you they are that you were uh, able to give them the entire afternoon and and listen to their problems or talk to them or just provide them with a sense of company you get people who will show up around the church just at random right not because they have something to do or they're uh, you know, being productive or moving forward, but because they just don't have anything else to do and uh, want to see if they could kill some time with the pastor well you don't have time for that most of the time, you will not have time for that. Uh, and as we said earlier, uh, a pastor is not primarily someone's friend, right? Not meant to fill that social void, particularly when that person has usually, or very oftentimes, a set of sinful attitudes and desires that are keeping them from having healthy relationships. The reason why they're lonely and bored is because they're self-absorbed and, and have huge Uh, issues to deal with. So if you're going to meet with them, make it to be to deal with those issues, to explain to them and and encourage them to be more Christ-like and caring and considerate of others so that people want to be around them. And then you've uh, hopefully not just um, placated them or become a sort of uh, accomplice in their sinful loneliness, but rather you become someone who can encourage them to grow uh, in Christ so that they have better relationships. So again, Uh, That's usually a no. 
uh, need uh, need does not necessitate calling is a great old phrase that my dad used to repeat often or repeats often just because someone can show up at, with a need does not mean that you're the one called to fill that need there may be a ministry that needs another board member there may be a ministry that needs another you know mission or money or whatever it is just because there is need does not mean that you are the one who needs to fulfill that calling and uh, again our hyper developed sense of conscience will very frequently bring us into the place of wanting to be an act as God and that is unhealthy and inappropriate, there is not uh, a chance in the world that you as a pastor will be able to meet all of the perceived or felt needs of the world at large, or even just of your church. There's times when they need to learn, when the people need to learn how to meet those con uh, those needs in a healthier way. And one of the ways you do that, one of these you support them, is knowing your yes, so that you can say, no, I, I, I'm afraid I don't have time for that, right? defending your time and learning to become uh, comfortable with the fact that people might even be upset. The pastor who says yes to everything is usually ineffective at accomplishing anything. I'm going to say it again. The pastor who says yes to everything is usually ineffective at accomplishing anything. Running around, harried and uh, concerned, trying to figure out how to do it all, the, all the things that he's committed to so that he can never really focus on a single task which the Lord has given him. So, th I guess the, the end of this is you're looking and thinking about your um, your situation as a pastor or as a minister, you got to figure out your place on the wall. You are not the one who's going to do everything in this church. In fact, Christ is the one doing all the heavy lifting. God is doing the holy lifting. The uh, heavy lifting. The Holy Spirit is doing the heavy lifting. You are fulfilling a function, or a role, a task, a place within that, and you need to find out where the Lord has positioned you on the wall, so that those people over there can do their part, and those people over there can do their part. And by running around trying to do everyone's part on the wall, of course, I'm drawing on the imagery of uh, Nehemiah and the walls of Jerusalem, right, where they're they're all. Uh, attending to their section of the wall and per defending the wall, you know, in parallel with that, you know, with the, the sword and the trowel, as it were. But uh, this idea of coming to find out where is the Lord placed you, gifted you, and prepared you to be on the wall, and then being excellent at that, keeping a focus on what the Lord's put in front of you and not getting distracted with what everyone else might have you do or wish you would do. What the Lord specifically gifted you to do in the work of edifying and leading your local church or your ministry. Figure that out. And then it becomes hopefully terribly plain when other opportunities come your way. You can, of course, evaluate them and say, does that fit with my... No, it doesn't fit with my yes. So you can say with all confidence, I, I, I appreciate your ministry and I pray the Lord blesses you, but I have a job to do here. And I'm currently unavailable. I don't have time to add into that. So what, uh, most, what is going to most fulfill these goals? As you understand the yeses of your ministry, the, the positive priorities of your life, what is going to help fulfill those goals and what's going to take away from it? So uh, 2 Timothy 2.2 2 tells us, All things that you have heard from me, Paul writing to Timothy, must uh, uh, me, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So right, again, part of your job is working yourself out of that job in terms of the church functions and you'll have that opportunity hopefully to do that within the context of building up other people so that you can train them to take on these uh, duties these positions these and, and help in the labor right discipleship works personal discipleship works and will encourage uh, you as well as others to again fill that uh, uh, fulfill that duty that the Lord's given you. So, here's your application questions. What's on your big yes list? Write it down. What is it? What is? What are the top three, maybe four things on your yes list? And as you look at your week last week, as you're keeping your, your diary or your schedule, what are you investing lots of time in that's really on your no list? There's probably something there. There's probably a lot of somethings there where you're letting things on the no list overtake the yes list or encroach upon the energy effort of the yes list. Finally, how can you train yourself to graciously say no based upon the biblical developed priority list? That's just a, a question for you to work out. You know your type. Maybe you're one of the you know, uh, frank and direct non-emotional types and you can just easily say, nope, I'm not doing that or I can't do that. Maybe you're a little bit more emotional and uh, if you're like me, 
I struggle to say no. I actually get angry when people put me in a position where I have to say no because I hate the thought of letting them down or I hate the thought of, of um, not fulfilling an expectation or I just want people to have what they want, right? I just want to be able to provide that. But uh, coming to a place of emotional and personal maturity that is able to say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do that right now without you know vitriol or anger or frustration or fear or whatever it is. So... How will you best say no to the no's and say yes to the yeses in, in practice? So your assignment for this final or this third module on priorities is when you consider your ministry, what are your top three priorities? What's your yes list? Maybe uh, cinch it down to specifically, you know, the church ministry. And what are some things on the no list that might be limited or removed from your time? So with that, we pray that God richly bless you in your continued uh, application of these ideas and principles, that you would be more effective as a minister for the Lord, and you would be able to enjoy him and grow closer to him with each and every passing day.